Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be invited here. Um, it's an honor, actually, to be on Balfour. I follow some of your presentation, and I always enjoy them, uh, and I think is uh, an important uh, voice uh, in the spectrum of um, of the situations that we have witnessed in the years throughout the years in uh, in Palestine and Israel. So today. I will focus on specifically on Gaza, uh, although as, as, as you, some of you might know, um, or many of you might know, actually, the, 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 the entire uh, occupied Palestinian territory has gone through a very, very uh, difficult time uh, since many years, um, but particularly after the uh, events in October, of course, we are confronted to a, an escalation of violence that uh, is unprecedented. Um, and um, it is difficult not to, to speak about West Bank and the complexities there, uh, but for the, you know, the subject of today's um, intervention, I will focus primarily and uh, actually solely on, on gas. Um, so, when we were discussing about how to prepare this uh, the, this session, we we were discussing about having an overview of uh, the uh, how aid and how the humanitarian assistance is delivered in in Gaza. Uh, I'm sure that you have heard many versions uh, of it. Uh, many medias and many uh, different authorities are are giving their way uh, their reading of events that uh, that are happening in in Gaza since uh, October. Uh, so what I will try to do today is to explain you what I see from where I'm sitting. I've been in Gaza since January five times um, for a time short period and at times a bit more uh, longer period. Uh, so I, I, I hope to be able to bring a little bit also the, the, the voice of the direct exposure to the situation I've witnessed first and in, uh, in, in Gaza. Um, let me start from stating very clearly that the counting of trucks is not a correct metric to measure humanitarian assistance in Gaza. Unfortunately, the entire world has been focusing on counting trucks, um, and I, and and they are not for several reasons. Um, first and foremost, because a truck is not a unique metric, right? Uh, you can have fuel on a truck that is bringing uh, gasoline to a desalination plant. The desalination plant can provide uh, drinking water to five hundred thousand people. Uh, the same measure, one truck, can bring mattresses, and in that case, it will be probably 100, 100 mattresses. So I think it is super important to go beyond uh, uh, counting trucks uh, and, and landing in a place where we look at what is needed, what is adequate, and, uh, and, uh, and that's the right way to look into our humanitarian assistance, get into gas. Um, we keep on saying, among colleagues that you know the the obligation of the party to the conflict are uh, to not only bring aid across the border but bring aid to people um, the obligation doesn't stop after the border and actually I would say that it I would almost say that it starts there because what is important as a humanitarian uh, aid worker is to to reach people wherever they are, um, and reach the people that are in need and trying to focus and, and, and prioritize those people that are mostly in need. Um, of course, the conditions in Gaza uh, are overwhelmingly dramatic. Um, we have basically 2.2 million people that are in desperate need of assistance, which is basically the entire population of Gaza Strip. Um, but that doesn't mean that everybody has the same level of, um, of uh, uh, vulnerability. So it's super important for us also to make sure that when we deliver a system, we really find the people that need it the most. Um, I have to say it's challenging. It has been challenging for seven months and it is still challenging day in, day out. Um, it's super important for us to make sure that uh, aid is consistently arriving. 
uh, we have gone through various periods. We start with a, an initial period where there was a complete blockade and impossibility to bring in Gaza anything. There were no entry of, of assistance um, to a point where, uh, in particular, I would say in the recent weeks, we had a progressive um, opening of, and, and I would say also, troubleshooting solution to issues that we have raised for months that finally uh, the authorities and the Israeli uh, military have decided to help us to address, um, at least in part. But, you know, I keep on describing this a little bit as a series of bottlenecks. So, so it's, it, it's a sequence. And if you have multiple bottlenecks, it's not that when you take one out, you then have reached the, the objective because there are another several bottlenecks that you have to go through and that's super important and that's why the the predictability of the the assistance is also very important of course this is co a combination of pipelines that are uh, are uh, consistently and, and 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 properly managed um, which begs the question of you know how also uh, uh, other states including egypt and and uh, and jordan uh, and other member states, uh, with the member state supports, have allowed this assistance to come in. Um, but it's also um, the necessity of, of the entire international community to support. And I have to say that, in general, if you look at the level of funding of the crisis in, uh, uh, in Gaza, we have a general support of, of member states. Um, our appeal has been largely uh, successful. Uh, but it's also true that we have 2.2 million people that needs everything. Uh, at the exclusion of the current population uh, in Rafa that has so far been able to remain in their home, uh, in their own houses, um, the rest of Gaza has moved at least once. Um, we have uh, 1.2 million people today in Rafa. Rafa in the past was 270,000 people. Um, and those people that are now in Rafa have moved at times seven times, you know, trying to seek uh, a safe place where to, to find shelter and, and, and live and, and survive, actually, uh, the, the, the war. Um, there has been a lot of uh, narrative around the, 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 the possibility to move south or to find a safe space. Reality is that there is no space, nowhere to be safe in Gaza. Uh, in the recent weeks, we have uh, our operation have moved in Rafa since uh, October. And in the recent weeks, for example, even in proximity to the guest houses and the offices where we work in Rafa, we hear the more and more the, the, the sounds of, of bombs uh, that are getting very close, if not literally no less than, than 500 meters the other day uh, to the office where the team works, and there was an attack that was um, a bomb that was uh, shot. So reality is that there is nothing safe. Uh, just for refreshing memory, since October, there is no electricity, there is no water um, at all in Gaza. Access to water was already complicated in the past, but there were three lines that were coming from Israel that were um, were essential to maintain uh, access to drinkable water. And then there were a lot of desalination plants across the strip that has been built with the money of the international community throughout the, the 20 years of, of humanitarian presence, unfortunately, in Gaza. And those have been progressively uh, made unable to work, basically. Now, two lines from, from Israel have been reopened, uh, which is good, and recently there has been a commitment to, to open a third line, reopen a third line. The problem is that the distribution network has been heavily impacted bombard by bombardments, so there is a lot of challenges that we're trying to fix um, and, and, and to, to bring back some, some, some decent level of, of access to drinking water, but this is not uh, enough. Uh, so far, the war has uh, taken a gigantic toll. I was, I was, so we're saying, you know, the, there is nothing, nowhere to be safe in Gaza. And today we count more than 34,000 people killed. Um, this amount doesn't take into account because we cannot estimate properly the amount of people that are still under the debris. 
uh, you know, as as you have seen in in, in picture of of the, the north uh, part of Gaza, Gaza City, Jabalia, uh, Beit Anun, Beit Lahia. Um, there are entire entire area that have disappeared. Um, the first time I was driving uh, a couple of months ago, three months ago, um, in in Gaza City, there were places that I could not recognize. The Gaza that I remember was no longer there. Uh, roads has been completely destroyed and disappeared. There are dirty roads everywhere and paths are done of, uh, you know, that have clearly seen tanks going through and so they're all ups and downs and, um, but, but there is no more paved road. Uh, and, um, and, and all around you have the scenery that seems, you know, uh, uh, almost a lunar scenery at times where even destroyed buildings have been completely then um, cleaned away. Uh, and so you have areas that in the past that were, you know, high rise and all in a sudden there is nothing. Um, we have accounted more or less for 70, uh, 80,000 uh, injured so far. Um, injured, being injured today in Gaza is simply dramatic. Uh, you have seen and followed the systematic attacks on, on hospitals. We have called systematically all the parties, would that be you know the armed groups that have at times um, uh, hidden weapons. We've never been able to prove it, but you know that were was the allegation that the Israeli were moving. But we call them not to do it uh, in a preventive manner because the the sanctuary that a hospital should be for everybody should be respected. And we call the Israeli to respect those hospitals. Uh, uh, I think that it's um, the systematicity within which we have seen the attack on hospitals. Um, it, it's really concerning. Is violating one fundamental element of international humanitarian law um, and is presenting a unbelievable price to people. The suffering uh, that generates is immense, not only because, I mean, those injured, of course, cannot be treated properly. I was reading yesterday some accounts, uh, an interesting report published by, by MSF that they were saying the impact, the psychological impact on, on health um, workers that have sp spent the last seven months basically amputating limbs uh, to, to, to injured uh, and, and and of course of this many are women and children um, are so traumatized at this stage that they have all the symptoms of, of, of post-traumatic disorder um, and, 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 and all this has been happening with a continuous degradation of the health uh, uh, the entire health systems with the less and less access to to basic uh, uh, drugs and, and equipment um, the UN, WHO in particular, of course, in this case, have struggled really to keep afloat uh, and, 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 and really restart even uh, hospitals. You know, Shifa Hospital, you might have followed a little bit. It was attacked uh, at the very beginning of the war. Um, it was completely dysfunctional. And then WHO went back trying to resume the, some, uh, some part of, of the services. And as it was going back to some minimal services, at least the emergency and some maternity, and um, again, it was attacked and, and completely uh, completely destroyed and damaged in a way that is uh, beyond repair at the moment. Um, so the, it is quite shocking to see the, the, the impact on, on the health facilities. Uh, and the systematicity of it is, is also of greatest concern. Um, big efforts have been uh, put from the humanitarian community uh, side to maintain some of these services. In some rare occasion, we managed to do it. As of today, uh, uh, we, we estimate that there are roughly 300,000 people that remain in the north. Uh, and let me share a map so I can at times point it to a map so you can see um, and have a better sense. Just tell me if you see it. 
Um, so uh, we, uh, I don't know if you have followed, but you know, basically today the Gaza Strip is divided in uh, by a, a, a corridor, a military road that has been uh, newly created in the middle of uh, uh, between Gaza and and Derbala, just north of the Wadi Gaza, so just north of this uh, streams. Um, that is now separating basically uh, the the north from the south. The north was the the center of Gaza, uh, the, the 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 highest density of population was there, uh, 1.2 million reside there, um, uh, out of the 2.250 that were there before the war, um, and uh, and now we have only 300,000 remaining in this area. Um, the and then the rest of the strip that in the past was, you know, with, with still very, very high density because, as, as you probably know, 365 kilometer, square kilometer of land were inhabited by 2.250 people. So this number, by the way, on the map is wrong. Um, it should be 2.2. Um, so th this is one of the highest density uh, of, of population concentration that you can see in, in the world. Um, so you can imagine what it means when the one, you know, 900,000 people moved south seeking for safety, which, as I said, they did not necessarily found, uh, what it means for them. Um, the, of course, the most impacted uh, have been women and children, unfortunately. Uh, there is an estimation that around 70% of the entire 34,000 people killed are women and children, and and we have seen seen that our you know, our breaking of parts of bodies hanging on on bombed apartments uh, in in Rafa. I remember a few months ago, uh, a horrifying picture of, of this young young girl, um, and and that's a reality, a daily reality for Gaza today. Um, the the systematic attack also not only hit hospitals, but also hit all civil infrastructure. Um, I think that the, the, the education colleagues have, uh, have published last week a, an analysis where they estimate that 73% of the schools have been destroyed. Um, and the, all the universities have been completely destroyed. And you have seen scenes of uh, Israeli army, you know, blowing up these universities, um, and again, uh, you know, the the destruction of civilian infrastructure are legitimate only when there are imperative military uh, objectives, um, and it you know it, it will be it will be necessary in the future to look into what was the rationale of, of those behavior. The result that we are dealing with, and this. Will be done by someone else, not by us. But the result of this is that basically the entire population of students of Gaza today do not go to school because the remaining schools they became uh, um, shelters for internally displaced people, uh, crowded, uh, cramped, uh, with uh, you know several hundred people sharing one bathroom, and you can imagine with limited access to water, uh, what it means for for the living conditions. Um, in, uh, two months ago, um, a, uh, it's a, it's an international institution that is devoted to, to do this type of studies. I've looked into the, the, the risk of famine and the situation of, of, uh, famine, uh, across Gaza. Um, it is called the integrated phase classification methodology, which is a, 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 an internationally agreed upon standard that has been used in all the crises from Somalia to Yemen to other places. Um, and um, and the, the expectation is that if by the end of, the month of, of May of this month, uh, things will not dramatically change, we will have uh, a potential famine in, uh, in Gaza. Um, I, the integrated um, phase classification has five degrees of seriousness, and uh, the estimate is at the moment there is 1.1 million people, so half of the population of Gaza, are on the highest level of this, uh, which is the emergency phase. Um, 
this is unprecedented. If you compare to uh, to Yemen, in Yemen, when there was the declaration of famine, there were 160,000 people in, uh, in 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 level in phase five. Here we're talking about 1.1 million. And what is particularly troubling as a humanitarian uh, professional is that this is a man-made and totally preventable situation. I think that. Uh, our advocacy has has somehow breached some uh, some of the audience on on the Israeli authorities, and it is true that in the last two or three weeks they have, as I said earlier, facilitated a little bit what we what we're trying to do. Uh, but the, expecting that this will solve the issue in in a matter of days is unrealistic. The reality is that to avert famine, it is a combination of food for sure, but also uh, is nutrition, uh, so it is therapeutic feeding that will help uh, uh, children and those are impacted by uh, by malnutrition to to get out and then be treated of their situations. It is about access to health. It is about access to water, and it is about sanitation. Those five components are fundamental to avoid famine. Um, so we are struggling day in day out to to, to avert famine, but. Um, we, we are not there yet. Um, particularly concerning as, of course, being the situation of the most vulnerable people, people with a uh, person with disability, elderly women, children, and accompanied and separated children. There is an estimation of UNICEF that there are 17,000, I repeat, 17,000 unaccompanied and separated children because of you know, situation of, of, of war, bombardment, people flees, people die, families split. And, 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 and of course, is, you know, communication is very limited. And, and so it becomes very difficult for, for families to, 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 to find their children. Uh, it, it's, it's simply beyond imagination, the, 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 the suffering. We have heard accounts, increasing accounts on gender-based violence. In this moment of desperation, as you can imagine, um, the most vulnerable are children and women, and and the the amount of violence that is exerted on them, would it be out of desperation? Would it be out of stress? Would it be out of you know whatever it is? Is simply um, uncautionable, and something that we are trying to deal with, um, but. Every day we're struggling to, to meet the basic requirements of 2.2 million people. Um, the, we have seen, unfortunately, scenes of, of people being shot in, in situations where there was aid distributions. Uh, some cases have, have quite largely gone on, on international media, but the reality is that it's something that we, we see with a certain regularity in, in Gaza. Um, and and of course, I mean, uh, you know, when parties start fighting in proximity of civilians, and believe me, I, I'm you know I'm, I'm calling out the parties is not only one side, but uh, but for sure uh, the there is an obligation to everybody to protect civilians, and I you know we have repeatedly called the parties to make make more efforts to protect civilians because what we have seen is not protection of civilians. Um, we estimate, as I said earlier, that there are around 630,000 children that are completely out of school. And the worst is that I don't think that they have any, there is very, very limited possibility that they will go back to school any soon, considering the level of destruction that we're witnessing. Um, it, it's simply, it's simply uh, unimaginable and, and, and and unfortunately, sadly, um, it's going to be a, a reality for a considerable amount of time that these children will not be able to go back to school. Um, our ability to operate has been extremely challenged, and I will show you a little bit this map. So basically, the bulk of the assistance that has entered into, into uh, Gaza so far has entered either through uh, Rafa at the beginning, and then at some point, uh, Israel accepted to open Karen Shalom. So 
uh, there is a, a scanning of the uh, humanitarian nature of the the, con the, the, the consignment is done either in Nitsana, which is down in the south here, or in current Shalom, and then the um, humanitarian assistance center here. And then it is distributed through either this road, which is the Salah Hadid road, or we go through town and then we go to the coastal road. Up to, of course, the south is relatively easier to serve, at the exclusion when there was the, the fighting in Khan Yunis that has created a lot of issues for uh, the humanitarian community to access uh, the, the middle area and the central area. Um, and then, of course, the, and keep in mind that in the south, we had 1.9 million people. So the bulk of people uh, are concentrated in the south. But, but still, there are 300,000 people that until November did not receive any assistance and since then have received really really drop fed uh, assistance because it, that's where we are still today when we go to the north we have to cross uh, checkpoints military checkpoints that have been extremely problematic uh, and, and complicated both because the situation on the roads are terrible because uh, the discipline at the checkpoint has been complicated at times um, because the uh, the amount of trucks available to do this operation is limited because we do not have access to fuel, uh, because we do not have access to all the commodity in a systematic manner um, due to the limitation of entry. So the, the chain of effects that would in normal circumstances allow any humanitarian operation to, to roll smoothly are, are here challenged altogether in a very uh, little piece of land. The recently, um, you know, we have heard about, you know, we've, you've seen airdrops have been initiated and uh, uh, a maritime corridor has been announced. Um, opening in the north has been announced and that's a great step forward that has been uh, finally accepted by the Israeli authorities. Uh, potentially also another uh, opening in this area called Zikim or Asiafa. And, and in the meantime, they had to open a, a, an entry point from this uh, side, which is called Gate 96. But that gate do not access directly to the north because it still goes through these two dots that are the, the, that are the checkpoint, basically, where we have uh, uh, the, the challenges that I was mentioning earlier. But, you know, as Yesterday, a, a team of, 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 of my staff has waited nine hours going through this checkpoint, either on the way up or on the way out, because they were fighting in the area. And then we had to wait and see what happened. And then uh, when the fight calmed down, there were um, very tight controls. Um, this morning, we were trying again, going around, uh, had, we have received the, the, the green light at, at nine o'clock to move there. And then we have been there at the holding point for three hours, again, waiting to go through the checkpoint. There were some military activity at the beginning and then for the next two hours, we've been waiting without any uh, clear explanation. So every day there is yet another challenge. Every day there is yet another problem to solve. Uh, and all this is constraining the ability of the entire humanitarian uh, community, including NGOs that are phenomenal uh, and, and brave people that have, you know, have decided to go in Gaza despite all this, uh, this, the, the, this challenging situation and the kinetic activities that are, believe me, quite intense and scary at risk of their life, as we have seen, unfortunately, a month ago with the colleagues of the World uh, Central Kitchen. Um, so it, it's really, you know, the compositional challenges that are, uh, are, are put in on us, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, constant. The one of the issues that we are also confronted with, which we are struggling with, of course, is when you have a, a war zone where the, 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 the military operation have destroyed everything, there is also a lot of unexploded ordnance. Uh, so 
we do not have as of today the capacity to clear those uh, those uh, unexploded ordnance what we can do is just to make sure that we find them and make sure that we stay far away but you can imagine that with the uh, with movement of population and you know, particularly if if a, a rafa operation as it has been announced will kick start um of course there will be an immense risk for the population that moves around because we were not able yet to, to clear zones uh, in across the across the strip. Um, we have constantly since the very beginning, and we continue to coordinate with the Israeli um, and to some extent with the, with the uh, with the Hamas and, and the other armed groups. Um, it's important. Um, it has allowed us to improve and move the dial on some areas. It has not solved all the issues, uh, but it's the only way we can uh, engage and continue the dialogue and push and advocate um, uh, because that's what we, we are meant to do in order to, to, to reach people. Um, unfortunately, you know, the level of uh, challenges on particularly on the crossing to the north, which requires coordination with Israeli because in general terms, humanitarian notify that we call humanitarian notification system because we tell the parties to the conflict we are going to from a to b because they have an obligation to facilitate humanitarian assistance and by the way by doing so we think we we deliver we help the parties to deliver their obligations uh and it's not only for for the humanitarian imperative that we uh, drive us but also is, is a legal uh, obligation for the parties but when then we have to cross checkpoints like in, in this area, we needed to have a coordination, meaning that we really have to talk to the military, make sure that there is an agreement on their side to go through. And that has still uh, is still a, a, a bottleneck in the entire process. As I said, it has improved, but with ups and downs. Um, this the coastal road at the moment uh, is also becoming problematic because the maritime uh, operation will block uh, at least temporarily this road and so we're trying also to find ways uh, to have another access that will allow us have, to have circulation from the south to the north uh, of our tracks that is a bit smoother and, and quicker that will allow us then to scale up uh, the operations um Last point, maybe before opening probably for a little bit of uh, questions and dialogue. We are all hearing about, hopefully, about the, the negotiation, the resumption of negotiation, and I really hope that they will find uh, an agreement that, that will bring a ceasefire, because only a ceasefire, and let's be clear, only a ceasefire will help us to really bring the humanitarian operation to the point where they will be meaningfully impacting the, um, the well-being of people. Um, we have recently published a, a flash appeal that is asking 2.8 billion. And this is just considering the limitation that we have and the ability that we have to deliver today from now to the end of the year. But only with the ceasefire we'll be able to deliver fully this amount of, of, of and, and these services to people. Um, but if that negotiation will not uh, be fruitfully concluded, we risk to go again uh, into another uh, military operation in Rafa, where we have 1.2 million people that have sick refuge on top of, uh, of you know, including the residents. So is 270,000 residents plus the, the, the remaining uh, population that moves out, that will have to again pack everything up and move to the north. That would be an immense problem, an immense suffering for people. People that has been living without water, without access to toilet, without access to, to water, and I figure out after you know seven months, six months of living there, a way to cope with this, all in a sudden that will be again moved and brought into where? Because the problem is that there is not much left. There is not. There are no services. There is no uh, water available in other areas. And so the humanitarian community will have to reinvent again operation to serve this uh, million people that might have to move. Um, and so the catastrophic impact on population will be simply uh, in.
Um, I we really hope that we will not be confronting this uh, this uh, this reality, but you know we are fearful that this is what we'll have to 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 confront with. Um, I think it's important for us to um, to make sure that we pursue and the, for the Israeli government to deliver on the commitment that they have uh, announced recently, which are positive, good, and, and I really you know I want to stress that this is the important trajectory that uh, has been recently taken, that, but they need to be materializing on the ground. Um, that will allow us really to scale up our operation and be able to serve the people wherever they are. Uh, we, we constantly call for protection of people. Pe civilians must be protected and is an obligation on the parties to make sure that whatever military objective they have to pursue, they want to pursue, they have to respect the life of civilians. Um, it's it's fundamental. Um, the wishful thinking, of course, uh, is is the resumption of electricity, water, public sector, and 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 free movement across the street. Uh, and and the most important of all, of course, is as I said earlier, ending the war uh, and finding a long term solution for this uh, horrific horrific war that we are witnessing here in Gaza. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks so much for laying that out so clearly for us because there's a lot of misinformation and confusing information that comes out to us here in the UK about what's going on in terms of aid to Gaza and with UNWA and so forth. So really, really helpful to, to have you explain that all to us. I'm gonna go straight into questions because we've already got a bunch. Um, I've got one from Jane Kaiser. She says, um, I'm finding the increased pleas from people who have lost everything to fund them. They're going around on Facebook, on WhatsApp and so forth. Please indicate if giving aid to people, fundraising to pay companies to move to Egypt is valid. Are demands for $5,000 plus justified? Is there no other way of exiting the war zone? So this is a sad chapter of the story in Gaza. Um, Gaza has been is is the only place in the planet where when a war starts there is nowhere to go. You cannot get out. You cannot get out to Israel, obviously, but you cannot get out to to Egypt either. And the sea, of course, is also sealed. Uh, and so, when you think at the worst, you know people will move and find safety somewhere else you know think ukraine and the, the size of ukraine and people move to the to the west and and find safety in gaza this is simply not possible and what has happened since the very beginning uh, uh, unfortunately is that a mechanism of <laughs> inhuman mechanism have, have been established where by paying you can pay your way out uh we have heard that the you know the price is between five to ten thousand dollars actually depends um and and somehow magically what is not possible for everybody becomes possible for the few that has the means to do it um yeah i i I stop here because it's you you draw your own conclusions and yeah. it is the sad reality of war um i found your talk uh, when you when you opened up about how trucks are not a standard unit of measurement i found that really interesting because um it hadn't even occurred to me that trucks could be different size and contain different <laughs> sized items so that in itself was was really interesting um I've got a question from Roger Harper Allen, who asks, has anyone asked Israel what their plans are for rebuilding after the war? Do you think that the Israelis are targeting homes? So, um, I don't think they're targeting home. I can tell you that they targeted home. It's a daily reality. Um, now, um, it is true that given the, the the type of warfare that has been initiated and the type of military presence that has been uh, consolidated in Gaza, 
where Biomass has built tunnels that are uh, you know across the street. Um, in several occasions, they are under civilian buildings, but um, that you know where you draw the line to justify that to to, um, to, to hit a tunnel, you can uh, destroy a ten stories building and killing fifty people, hundred people. What is the right proportion? You know, in, in, in international humanitarian law, there is a concept of proportionality. Where you draw the line of proportionality? And now, an illegal expert will tell you that proportionality is, a, is one of those principles that is impossible to prove legally, and, and, and it has not been ever proved, I think. Uh, but, but, but I think from the humanity perspective, ca can we not agree that there is a limit to what war should be allowed? And the reality, as I, as I hope I made clear during the presentation on the health facilities, I do believe that um, the basic law of war have, have not been respected. And this is not a problem only for Palestinians in Gaza, but it's a problem for the entire humanity because we are allowing something that we should have never allowed to happen. Um, it, it's a step back for, for humanity and, and, and it's causing a immense pain when you have you know entire family wiped out in a second children women elderly men um just because there might be a tunnel or there might be a, a, an amass operative is that a right measure I, I don't know i mean as a human being and and uh, i'm very troubled by that and and i think that we should be mindful of that so who's gonna pay the bill i have no idea i don't think that I mean, historically, we have seen that the the, the events in Gaza, uh, recurrent war, have always then presented the bill to the international community. Uh, this time around, not only the devastation is beyond imaginable, because believe me, I've seen areas where they do not exist anymore. Uh, there is no more the, the neighborhood. So the... I think in uh, January, the, the, the World Bank made an initial assessment that we're calculating 18 billion of damages. And that was January. Um, it was before Khan Yunus. Khan Yunus has been, in, in some areas, completely flattened. It doesn't exist anymore. I was driving two weeks ago in, in Khan Yunus, and you, you, you go in a car and you are two meters under the level of, of the street, and you have all the rubble put on, on the on the buildings that are standing next to you and then you look up and all the building is is damaged and hit by shells and so i i think that the bill will be gigantic and i have no idea what will be um how it will be rebuilt it will take you know decades now before getting there we have to make sure that we do stop the the killing and 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 the, and the pain for people that are living there and then we will discuss about reconstruction. Yeah, um, we've got a couple of different questions about aid coming into Gaza by the by sea. So, for example, Paul Hughes Smith asks about the impact of the aid flotilla from Turkey that was scuppered by the political actions of Guinea-Bissau. Um, is aid by sea a possibility? What are the restrictions there? So, one of the uh, most recent uh, uh, important steps that the government of Israel has taken is that they allowed the utilization of the port of Ashdod for delivery of humanitarian assistance, which is a, a major, major step forward because it's a big harbor uh, equipped and able to, to, to accept um, a considerable amount of, of commodities. Um, there is, of course, always the devil is in the details, there is a, a limitation in the ability that they have to scan what, um, what is in the, in, in, in the aid uh, uh, consignment. And we respect the, the concerns about security, given what has happened historically in Gaza. So, um, but that, uh, that is something that has to be looked into and, and, and developed. Uh, if by maritime corridor you mean the, the announced uh, operations by uh, the, the, the Americans and the the president of the United States. I think we will see, uh, we expect that operation to start. Uh, we will see, my understanding is at the moment, uh, it will um, it, it will start with 50 trucks per day, which is not enormous. 
Um, the bottom line for us has always been, as, as United Nations, we have said, whatever comes additional is good, but let's not lose focus. The access via land is the key, and it has to be maintained and sustained and simplified and streamlined in a way that is adequate to the needs of people. And it's not only quantity, it's also quality, because, you know, uh, solar lamp, like something like this, is not allowed in Gaza, simply because it can be considered dual use. Um, latrines have been complicated to bring in. Uh, chemicals for the desalination plants have been complicated to bring in. Generators, with lack of electricity, everything works on, 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 on generators. And to, as of today, you know, we had a gigantic problem of cash availability uh, inside Gaza because there are two ATM functioning. Two. <laughs> um, and, and of course, you know, ATM needs energy, need, so generator that needs fuel, and fuel is controlled and limited. So, again, uh, the obstacles are many. That's why it's super important to maintain land, 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 land access because it, it's, it's the only way to solve that and expand the diversity of products that we can bring in. I had read that uh, animal feed was now on the restricted list as well, which is particularly devastating because I also read that apparently a lot of humans are surviving off the animal feed. So that list of so it's it's interesting, uh, Diana, that you mentioned that the uh, colleagues from FAO have, have been mentioning this since the very beginning of the war because, of course, it was a, a, a good way to maintain self reliance uh, when you have you know chicken or or, or or the donkeys and and then you realize that is animal feed is important for sure for for for, for animals uh, and like poultry, but donkey have been the success story in order to bring around water to people. Because there are areas like in Rafa, there is no wells, there are no wells. So water has to be fetched in uh, in in another, in Kanyunis and then being brought uh, to, to, to Rafa. So to do that, when you are running out of fuel and cars cannot uh, move anymore, there are some that can still do that because we, we managed to, to provide them some fuel, but the vast majority is donkey cart and that are bringing water for people. But the donkey has to survive. And so feeding uh, fodder for animals is super important. And I've heard that recently there was a, it was approved, but it, for for six months, um, it has not been approved. It's just terrible. I just can't imagine living like that. Um, I've got a question from Andrew Whitley, the chair of the Balfour Project. Could you address the issue of those badly injured children who need to be evacuated abroad for medical treatment? How many in your estimate? Who decides who is eligible and then takes the decision to let them out? Who then looks after them and where do they go? Are they able to take companions like parents with them? So another chapter of, of tremendous suffering and sadness. Um, which is even complicated because not only we have the newly injured with you know thousands of people that have been amputated, um, that have no access to any type of rehabilitations and and um, and support, but uh, those patients whose pathologies cannot be treated inside Gaza. The reality is that we had a list of nine thousand cases that were supposed to be. Uh, evacuated and only half of those have been allowed, a, a bit more than half, to evacuate. And the, one of the issues is that there is a, a, a very tight restriction on ages. So um, male above uh, 18 cannot exit. The, 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 the percentage of male above 18 that have been allowed to exit is really minimal. Um, children uh, below 18 then needs to have a companion but they can be they have to be women and they have to be older than 55 which means that young mothers <laughs> cannot bring their children out uh, I remember when cross once I was uh, uh, I was at the crossing when there was a couple 
Um, so the story was the mother had cancer, the child had a heart disease, and the father wanted to bring them out. And the, the only possibility for her was to either send him, back then was not that restriction that on, on gender that I just mentioned, it was either to send him alone with the baby or uh, going with the baby, but then she said, I cannot take care of the baby if I'm also under treatment for cancer. So there was this, and, and the, the authority would allow only one of the two parents to get out. Uh, so, and, and stories like this, unfortunately, uh, are endless. Unfortunately, and something that I should have said probably earlier, is nobody's telling these stories. Because remember, there are no press, no international press is allowed on the seventh month of war. Too. Um, and, you know, as much as we, we try to also break the stories, what we focus on is more, you know, doing the assisting people. Um, and, and, and we, you know, we're probably not good at, enough to, to, to circulate all these stories. But the amount of stories of this are, are terrible. How they are then treated and when they go outside, I know that those who was with a companion, of course, are, 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 are followed by their, by, by their family members. I know that some member states um, have opened a certain amount of slots for, uh, for patients to be referred. Um, at some point, there was also a French boat and a British boat, I think also a medical boat that was treating injured. But the reality is that the, the number of people evacuated, medical evacuated from Gaza is far from what it should be. And I, we have no data on the excess of fatalities linked to treatable diseases that have not been treated in the last seven months. You know, I was in the European Gaza hospital a month ago, and I was seeing that they have a, a department where they do catheterization for heart. Uh, and they said, this is the last machine available in Gaza. If we lose this hospital, we will lose the last possibility to do this life-saving surgery that are, you know, routine, uh, kind of, um, that can save lives, but you know, we, there is only one. The last uh, uh, X-ray, you know, how you say, the TAC machine, the, 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 those specialized uh, devices. So it, it's really, an, it, the entire system has been put on, on, on its knees. That's the reality. It seems like people are just facing daily Sophie's Choice out there and it's horrendous. I would like to just make a little appeal to support the Balfour Project um i will be posting the link in the chat box we put these webinars on for free um and we would like to continue doing so because we think it's really important in terms of spreading information and and giving people the information they need in order to go on and do very important work um on this cause so um i will pop the donation links in the chat box and um including how to become a friend of the balfour project like i said it just helps us with our forward planning um, it reduces our admin costs if you sign up to give us regular donations, monthly donations. Um, and also do check out our website for things like our upcoming conference and so forth. If you're not uh, signed up to our mailing list, you can do that on our website as well. We will be sharing the recordings of this um, webinar as well by email in, within the next couple of hours. So please do share this far and wide with anyone that you think might be interested. Um, I am going to try to end this on a hopeful note um it's getting harder and harder to do that but i'm trying um i will say that i'm going to be sharing the chat box as always with andrea so do po post post any uh question and uh, any comments that you have for him in there he will be looking at it after the talk um but my last question which is a little accumulation of of a bunch of ones that have come up is what can we do here us here based in the UK who feel quite helpless, um, what do you think that we can do in order to help the situation at all? Is it a case of donations? Do we just carry on writing to our MPs? So we have seen um, a progressive shift on the, on the trajectory of, of the behavior of, the, of, of Israel. 
um, vis-a-vis -vis this situation. I, I think is only international pressure will bring this to a reasonable outcome. Um, you know, we didn't speak about, and and I should have mentioned that. You know, what has happened in October, we have unequivocally condemned as the United Nations. So there is no excuses. And we keep on asking for the release of the hostages. So it's something that really, you know, we cannot and we should have never linked the release of hostages with the, the, the deliver of humanitarian assistance or with the respect of international humanitarian law. Um, no, those things should be remain separated. I think that hearing the voices of, of constituencies for your politician is important. They have the ability to change the direction of things. Um, and, and they have to do it with all the means of influence that they can exert. Um, you know, and, and that's where we should go because that's the only hope to, to, to give some glimpse of hope for the children uh, in Gaza. Um, if we think that we will not pay collectively the price of such a failure, um, it's, it's a fundamental mistake because this is a, a crossroad for the credibility of the humanitarian uh, principles, the humanitarian aid, the United Nations and the international community credibility vis-a-vis -vis what we have preached and defended which is the values of the UN Charter, the international humanitarian law, and human rights. Um, so I think we have to keep on putting pressure on, on those who have... So the other day, the, the humanitarian coordinator said something that I think is the real answer. We are the nurses. Politicians are the doctors. We will deal with the symptoms, but the root causes of the disease can be dealt only by doctors. And so you are the ones who decide who the doctors are and how they behave. And that's, I think, how we, we have to move the dial. Thanks for that. Um, we will keep on doing what we can. Um, I want to thank you so much, Andrea, for taking time out to come and speak to us because you must be incredibly busy right now. I want to thank all of our attendees, as always, and I want to make another little plea to share this webinar when you get the email with all the recordings. It will be with all our other past webinars in the past events section on our website um, within the next couple of hours. So please do share far and wide, share it with your MP. Uh, let them see what's actually going on on the ground. So again, Andrea, thank you so much. And I'm thanking you on behalf of all of our attendees because I'm getting a lot of messages thanking you for your hard work and giving you um, best wishes and, and courage to carry on. And um, we will hopefully see a lot of you attendees at the conference in some capacity, either online or in person. And, um, and I wish you all a lovely rest of the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. Bye.